Good morning. So today we're in part two of our series entitled Family Matters. And in this series, we're searching through scripture and we're trying to find some ways that we can speak hope and healing uh, into our family relationship. I, I don't think anybody would argue that our families are the most important people in our lives and we want to do everything that we can uh, to set those up for success in every possible way. And I just want to make mention last week, Pastor Jamie did an incredible job of kind of leading us into this series in part one as she talked to our moms last week. Today we're going to shift our topic a little bit and we're going to lean into our marriage commitments. And I just want to say to you, I know some of you are saying, well, I'm, I'm not married, Pastor. I can, I can tune out this morning or maybe I wish you'd stay at home in bed. I hope that's not you today. Uh, I would encourage you to tune in because we're not only aiming to create healthy marriages, but we're trying really to use scripture and the truth of God's word to correct a massive amount of cultural misinformation when it comes to the living out of our biblical faith in all of our commitments. And, and I really do think whether you're married or not, maybe one day you will be, maybe you have been and, not, and are not currently. I, I think a lot of the principles that we're going to talk about this morning will help us in, in other areas of our life. So just, just hang with me if you would. But I want to be honest today. I, I, I sense that a lot of marriages are struggling. A lot of marriages are struggling. I, I don't know that marriage has ever been easy. Uh, some of you in this room, you've been married for decades and decades. It seems like forever, right? Been a glorious journey. Uh, and, and yet, you know, it, it, I think it's getting harder. I, I really do. I think because of our culture, so many things are happening around us. I, I think it almost seems like our culture is doing everything possible to challenge the traditional biblical marriage commitment that we made when we stood before our, our, our families and our friends and, and before God. You know, on top of that, we have a lot of things going against us. And some of it's our own fault, to be honest with you. We've got out of control schedules. Can I get an amen? Out of control schedules, limitless opportunities to overcommit ourselves, unbalanced priorities, unhealthy distractions, social media obsessions. I, I, I think we live in a self-centered world where it's all about the individual. It's all about me, my happiness, you know, uh, have it your way. Those kind of slogans are everywhere and that's just not healthy. Unrealistic expectations. Oh my goodness, we could talk about that for days. Poor communication practices. Well, that's nothing new. Distorted views of gender, sexuality, and virtue. Oh my goodness, could we spend some time on that this morning. I, the list could go on, but I think it's safe to say, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Amen? We have a problem. I, I think a lot of us are feeling that. A lot of us are sensing that. And I just want to say to you as I, as I come before you, I always kind of come, uh, you know, it used to be when I was a young man, I knew all the answers. You know what I mean? I, I used to know everything about being a parent until I had kids, you know. I used to know everything about being married until I got married, you know, and put a few years under my belt and all those kind of things. So I don't come to you this morning with the, with, with the one who is uh, problem-free, okay? Can I just say that? Can, can, is it okay for you to know that your pastor has problems in his marriage too and in his family? I mean, we all have struggles, amen? Are you with me so far? No, you don't, don't get up and leave. But I'm someone who is imperfectly learning to do it God's way, just like you. And, and, and we have to grow through things ourselves. So you can ask Rochelle and she'll tell you that sometimes I am a pain in the rear end. Can I just say that? I, I mean, she'll tell you. You know, she gave me permission this morning because she's working in the back with the kids. I could say anything I wanted to say. <laughs> and you guys will never tell. I know how good you keep secrets. So I, she shouldn't have done that this morning, but... But she did. So today, I, I just want to talk about some things. Can I just, can I phrase it this way? Some things to consider before you quit. Some things to consider before you quit. What do we need to think about before we walk away, before we just say, you know, I've had it. 
And I wouldn't be surprised if there's some folks in here this morning who are, who are thinking about it. I, I remember Ruth Graham, uh, Reverend Billy Graham's husband, uh, uh, Reverend uh, Billy Graham's wife. She said one time as she was being interviewed about their marriage, and, and the question was asked, you know, have you ever considered divorce? And she said, never. Murder, yes. Divorce, no. <laughs> so I... I mean, if, if the Grahams can be at that point, I, I think a lot of us can relate to that as well. So what are some common reasons that Americans get divorced? I did some research on this. You've probably heard some of these before. Number one reason Americans get divorced is a communication breakdown. Now, that's not new. That's not something that surprises anybody. I, I know some marriages, you know, they just do not communicate. There, there are just issues that prohibit them. They are dysfunctional in their communication. And boy, that is a big one. Number two, infidelity. Infidelity. Boy, you, it just breaks your heart. You hear the stories and you see people make tragic mistakes. And boy, it's one of the reasons that a lot of folks head to court. Number three, constant fighting. Constant fighting. Now, as I said already, we all fight, right? In fact, I, I've said that before from the pulpit. I said, you know, we all fight. And I've had people come up to me, just beautiful people, I can tell you. They come up to me afterwards. They say, Pastor, you know, my wife and I, we have never argued once. And I'm like, you are lying to me. <laughs> because you may not have verbally argued, but I'm telling you, you have had disagreements. You just chose to keep your mouth shut, which isn't always bad. We all fight. We all have disagreements. There's a healthy way to do it. Amen? Number four, money. Money. Now, it's not money that is, you know, the thing that causes fight. It's disagreements about the money uh, that, that causes arguments and a lot of people to get into trouble. Disagreements about how to spend the money, money priorities. When money gets tight, stress goes up. Number five, hate to say it, one of the common reasons Americans get divorced is abuse, but it's tragic. You know, if you're, being, if you're being abused, you need to tell somebody. You need to tell somebody, and you need to get to a safe place. There's, there's some ways to find help, but that causes a lot of divorce. Number six, boredom. Now, I'm not saying all these are good reasons. Can I just say, I'm not, I'm not saying any of these reasons. I mean, infidelity, Scripture talks about, that's a, that's a grounds for divorce. But I'm not, I'm not telling you, I'm not standing before you this morning saying, hey, these are all legit reasons for you to get a divorce. Don't hear me, don't hear me say that. But these are what Americans say oftentimes. And, and boredom, I, that's a pretty measly excuse if you ask me. Boredom? Well, then liven up a little bit, you know? Boredom, that's, but that's one of the reasons. Number seven, number seven, falling out of love. But we're going to talk about this this morning because this is garbage right here. Falling out of love. But a lot of people say, hey, that's the reason that we got divorced. We just didn't love each other anymore. Fundamental misunderstanding of love. I'm sure you could add more to that list, but here's what I want to do today. I want to get to the heart of the problem. Because even though those are some very specific things on that list that often lead to divorce, most of the things on that list, listen to me, most of the things on that list stem from a bigger problem than just what you see there at face value. In other words, those are symptoms in many cases, symptoms of a much bigger problem. And the much bigger problem, the, the much bigger thing that is, that is uh, we often forget and that causes those kinds of things uh, is that we forget our marriage commitment. Our marriage commitment. And so this morning, if you'll bear with me, we're going to talk about something really old-fashioned today. I mean, we're going to go back to what some people are going to say, this is just archaic, this is obsolete. We're just going to talk about good old-fashioned commitment. Because when it really boils down to it, that is a huge part of what marriage is all about. You know, we could sit up here and I could, I could preach a message. I've done it and I'll do it. But we're going to talk about, you know, tips, you know, how to, how to get along, tips and principles and, and, and methods. But if we don't understand what marriage commitment is, when things get tough, we're still going to run for the exits if we don't understand commitment. So I ran across something, you know, you gotta, this is a pretty heavy topic, so I thought I'd start with something funny. 
And boy, you, when it comes to marriage, you can find some funny things. So here's what I found. This is, this is what the, the, the wife expects in, message, in, in marriage, what the man expects. The ideal wife, what does every man expect in his wife? All right, here we go. That she will always be beautiful and cheerful. That she could have had movie stars, but only wanted you. What does a man expect? Number three, beauty that doesn't run in a rainstorm. Number four, never sick, but allergic to jewelry and fur coats. In fact, allergic to anything expensive and the TV remote, amen? What every man expects, insist that moving furniture by herself is good for her figure. She's an expert in cooking, cleaning house, fixing the car, the TV, painting the house, and keeping quiet about it. What every man expects, favorite hobbies of his wife, mowing the lawn and shoveling snow. Yeah, right. What every man expects, a wife that hates credit cards. Can I get an amen this morning? Oh, I got kind of quiet on that one. Her favorite expression, what can I do for you, dear? Thinks that you have the brain of Einstein but look like Captain America. Every guy thinks that. Wishes you would go out with the boys so she can get some housework done. Every man expects that. And loves you because you're so sexy, right? What every man expects of his wife. Now, that's the ideal wife. That's what every man expects. Now, here's what he gets. Hang on now. Here's what he gets. Here's what it gets. She speaks 140 words per minute with gust 180 words from time to time. She was once a model for a totem pole. <laughs> this is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> She's a light eater. As soon as it gets light, she starts eating. <laughs> Where there's smoke, there she is cooking. She lets you know that you only have two faults, everything you say and everything you do. <laughs> Here's what he gets. No matter what she does with it, her hair looks like an explosion in a steel wool factory. <laughs> and if you get lost, just open your wallet and she'll find you. All right, ladies, your turn. The ideal husband, what every woman expects, hang on, guys, that he will be a brilliant conversationalist. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That he is very sensitive, truly loving, emotionally supportive, what every woman wants. We could talk about that. Very hardworking. A man who helps around the house by washing dishes, vacuuming floors, and taking care of the yard getting quiet. Someone who will help raise the kids. Well, there's a novel thought. A man of emotional and physical strength and a man who is as smart as Einstein but looks like Brad Pitt. That's what every woman <laughs> expects. But here's what she gets. He's always taking her out to restaurants. One day she'll ta he'll take her in. <laughs> he doesn't have ulcers. He gives ulcers. I like this, what she gets. Every time he has an idea in his head, he has the whole thing in a nutshell in no time at all. Sounds like a man. He's well known as a miracle worker. It's a miracle when he works. What she gets. He supports his wife in a manner in which she is accustomed. He lets her keep her job. He is such a bore that he, he even bores you to death when he gives you a compliment. And he has occasional flashes of silence that make his conversation brilliant. <laughs> like that. What she gets, her idea, or his idea, excuse me, his idea of quality time is watching a football game and a carry-out pizza while she watches the TV in the back bedroom. <laughs> and his idea of romance is a nudge under the covers. <laughs> what she gets, what they expect, our expectations are not always the same. Let me give you the golden rule of any marriage. A golden rule of any marriage is very simple. Number one, you can write it down. 
what you want in your spouse produce first in your own life. I never cease to be amazed at how simple this is, but how complicated we make it. What you want in your spouse, produce first in your own life. It's amazing how we get it backwards. We're not getting what we want, what we expect in our spouse, and so we, we criticize, we attack, we get negative, we do all kinds of things, and then we expect for that to produce in our spouse that, that positive element that we're looking for. And in, 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 if you read that Love and Respect book, uh, book uh, that's very popular today, you know, it's, it often talks in there about love being that number one need for women to be cherished, to, to be loved and nurtured. And so often we see a, a woman needing that, but, and she attacks her husband, expecting then him to feel the warm fuzzies toward her. And, and for a man, they, they need that respect. They need to be respected. And in order to get that respect, we belittle our spouse, and we just kind of are crossing in the night. We're not going to get it done. What you need to do is if you want it in your spouse, produce it in your own life First, amen. I think there's, there's a lot we could talk about there. Let's go on to number two. Love is a commitment. Love is a commitment. Listen to me this morning. If you get nothing else, feelings or no feelings. Feelings or no feelings. Love is based on one's vow, one's word, one's promise. And the reason this is so very true is because feelings come and feelings go. Feelings change over time. They are frequent, they are infrequent, but commitment stays the same. The commitment, the, the scripture is clear about love and the commitment of Love. Robert Taylor in his book, The Art of Staying Together, says, we're now living in an age of disposability. Use it once and throw it away. Over the past decade, there has developed a feeling that relationships are equally disposable. We basically have the idea that if something breaks, throw it out. Throw it away, get something new. And it has happened not only in everything we own, but it's also happened in the area of marriages and relationship. I think there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of truth to that. Take your Bibles with me this morning. Let's, let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. This is a passage that really is the foundation of everything that we're going to talk about today. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And I want to read verses 4 and 5 to you, just short but it gets right to the point of how God feels about our promises and our commitments and our, and our vows. Ecclesiastes 5, beginning with verse 4, listen to what he says. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. This scripture gives us a glimpse of, of just how God views those commitments and our promises and our vows. So let's spend some time trying to understand why our vows uh, matter and, and how we can strengthen those. That's what the, the point of this is. You know, I, I don't know about you, but you know, weddings are just wonderful occasions, aren't they? I mean, this is kind of the wedding season, isn't it? You probably all have a number of weddings to go to this, this summer. I, I, I thought back over the past 30 years, I've probably done 70 or 80 weddings. I don't know. It's kind of hard to keep track. It, it, it's great, though, when you see the bride and the groom, they see each other for the first time on that day, and it just kind of makes everybody cry, you know, kind of just, just so touching. You know, he's all dressed up in his suit, or at least they used to be, and now it's all kinds of casual. But, but maybe you got a tuxedo on, you know, and, and you, see the, you see the bride in that beautiful white wedding gown. And then they, they, she comes down the aisle, they join hands, they look at each other, and you can just see the love dripping off of them. And they're about to exchange their wedding vows. And you know, it's about this time as I'm performing the ceremonies, and sometimes I just want to stop the whole thing. I know this would probably ruin the whole moment, but I just want to stop the whole thing, and I just want to have a private conversation with the couple. I'm like, guys, do you really know what you're about to do? Because it's so much more than just saying things that sound nice. 
You know, we've got beautiful poetic language we use when it comes to weddings and all oh, it rhymes and everything. And, and, and it, it, yeah, I want to say, you know what, it's, it's more than just nice words. It's more than just a ritual so we can get on to the reception, you know. Saying things like, to have and to hold from this day forward. How many of you remember that was a part of your wedding vows? This really, almost every wedding, to have and to hold from this day forward. You see, that very expression, to have and to hold, comes from a biblical foundation, which basically says that once this man and this woman get married, the two become one. And, 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 and as they become one, that means I no longer have control over my body alone. My body is hers and her body is mine. And all of a sudden, instead of me living for myself and putting my own needs and my own interests first, it becomes not me or mine. It becomes ours and us and, and we. And we look after our interests together. In fact, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says it beautifully. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 and 4. He says, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body. Are you hearing this? She does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. How is that? Why is that? It's because they're no longer two individuals. It's not, long, it's not mine and hers. It's ours. It's not two. It's one. It's one flesh. From this day forward. It's a picture of permanence. In fact, if you go back to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Now, now you're probably a, a, accustomed to hearing this out of the NIV. This morning, I want to read it out of the, the English Standard Version because I like the way it, it emphasizes this permanence. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and what? Hold fast. Now, your version might say, uh, might, might be united. Some translations say cling, but I like this idea of holding fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. You know, that holding flat fast, that, that, that gives some implication of effort, of commitment, that this thing is not just going to change based on our whims or our feelings, but that we're going to hold it fast. Not from this day forward, if I get everything I want, not from this day forward if I'm happy. Not from this day forward if everything goes my way or if I feel like it. You see, that's why vows are important. The very words of our wedding vows tell us what's ahead. And you know, pastors, we try to help you. We really do. We try to help you in the midst of that beautiful ceremony. We say some things that we're hoping will get your attention. Let me give you some examples. To have and to hold from this day forward. What is the next thing we say? For better or worse. Now, though we don't put that in there just because it sounds nice. It's because we put that in there because we know what's coming. Better's coming and a whole lot worse is coming. We try to help you. We say for richer or poorer. I don't know which is coming, but one of the two is probably coming. Maybe both are coming. We're trying to help you. In sickness and in health. Those vows are, are, are presented that way for a reason. Because marriage, as many of you know all too well, has its ups. And boy, does it have its downs. And the message is that in every marriage, there are going to be some incredibly difficult days ahead. And you see, we don't stay committed just until we're no longer happy. That's what the culture would tell you. Oh, we stay together until we're not happy, and then we go find somebody else that makes us happy. Marriage isn't dependent on your happiness. Oh, I thought I'd get one amen there. I'm not saying you won't be happy, but marriage isn't dependent upon your happiness. I still didn't get an amen. 
The naivete of people always amazes me when it comes to the commitment in marriage. Somehow we think that all the stuff we say, the vows, the commitments, well, it just kind of belongs in the ceremony. It sounds so good, but they really are, they really are just words, right? Ho, ho, ho. I guess that would be something if it were just kind of a human-to-human contract of some kind. But this is more than that. You know, those words, they are a beginning of a covenant, you see. It's a covenant, and it's not just between you and her or her and you. It's between you two and somebody else. It's a covenant. In fact, what it says in in Malachi chapter 2 Verses 13 and 14, you say, oh, pastor, it's Old Testament. Oh, I tell you, this, this gives us a pretty good insight as to how God views our covenants, our marriages. Listen, Malachi 2, verses 13 and 14, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor. Are you hearing this? With favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. Verse 14 tells us why. You ask why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. You see, this isn't just about you and her or her and you. This is about the three of you. You stood before God. You said, I do, not only to her. You said it before God. Every wedding I've ever done, I've said, we make this covenant not just with you, but with him in the sight of God and the presence of these witnesses. And again, I want to stop the whole ceremony and say, listen, today is a very good day in your life. Everybody's happy today. Think about it for a moment. There they are holding hands. She's beautifully arrayed in white. He's got his tux on. He's got his best friend. She's got her best friend. The family is close. Beautiful flowers, beautiful music, a reception afterwards with wonderful food and cake. You know, if there's cake, I'm there. I mean, listen, folks, it's a very good day. If you couldn't feel a tingle on that day, your tingler ain't working. If your liver don't quiver on that day, your your liver's got a problem. But what amazes me is people walk out of that building. They walk out of this building. And so, so often after a period of time, they say, you know what? I just, I just don't feel the same way about you anymore. I don't feel the same way I felt when I married you. I mean, who would think about that day? Think about how special that day was. I mean, who? nobody would feel that way. On that day, everybody waited on you. Everybody babied you. Everybody fluffed your hair. Everybody made sure everything was perfect. They showered you with love and compliments. Did you really think the rest of your life was going to feel like that day? Listen, marriage isn't easy. I've come to believe this. Marriage is only for tough people who understand commitment. Wimps should not get married. If you're a quitter, don't get married. Marriage is for tough people who understand commitment. So for the rest of our time this morning, I want to talk about two types of people and what we need to have if our marriages are going to endure. We're going to talk about a convenience mindset. We're going to talk about a commitment mindset, okay? Okay. So here we go. And I think, again, this is something that applies to every part of your life, business, other relationships, your marriage for sure. So let me give you in the next few minutes what you can do if you want to have a better marriage. The difference between convenience people and commitment people. Number one, convenience people are emotion-based. We've already talked about this. People that do things because it is convenient to them because they are literally ruled by their emotions. Emotion people. Convenience people are emotion-based. Number two, people who are committed. This is the second part of number one. People who are committed are not emotion-based. They are character-based. Character-based. Now, there is a huge difference between do I make decisions out of emotion or do I make decisions out of my character? We'll talk more about that. Number two, convenience people are always asking, what is easy? What is easy? Can I just say this morning, there is very little in marriage that's easy when, 
when there's stress. They're always looking for shortcuts. They're always looking for an easy way to get there fast. That's much like some people who are in, 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 in Christianity, people who are following Jesus. They try to, they try to have this passionate, life-changing relationship with Jesus, uh, you know, five minutes a week. It's not easy. Character people or committed people, they ask the question, what is right? Not what is easy, what is right? There's a difference between asking what is easy, what is right, what is right is seldom easy. Does that make sense? Number three, convenience people say, when I feel good, then I'll do it. When I feel good, then I'll do it. They're always waiting to feel good before they take action. Listen, again, feelings are temporary. No marriage based on feelings will last. No commitment based on feelings will last. Committed people say, when I do it, then I'll feel good about it. Then I'll feel good. There is a world of difference between the two. There are people waiting to feel it before they do it. You're going to be waiting a long time. Feelings cannot be depended. They cannot be trusted because the heart of man is, what does the Bible say? Wicked. Number four, convenience people are controlled by moods. You see, convenience people are controlled by how they feel. Again, they're controlled by, by well, if I, do, I, do I want to do this today? They're always letting their moods control them. Convenience people, committed people are controlled by priorities. Do you do things every day by how you feel because it's right or is it a priority in life? Number five, we could spend a lot of time on this. Convenience people have a selfish mindset. Selfish mindset. Basically, they want everybody to cater to them, whereas committed people have what I call a servant mindset, a servant mindset. They're constantly thinking of the other person. And let me just say this, after years and years and years of counseling and working with people on this, um, let me tell you one thing that I found. If you want a near perfect marriage, and let me say no marriage is perfect, but as close to perfect as you can get is you got two people who are serving each other, who are servant-minded. If I'm thinking more about them than I'm, about, you know, this is a basic spiritual principle that Jesus said, love your brothers yourself. If we would simply take that as a part of our marriage relationships, our marriages would be so much better. Two servants, you can literally work through anything if you both have a servant's heart. Number six, convenience people their life and their lips disagree. Commitment people's life and lips agree. We're talking about hypocrisy or sincerity. Their life and their lips disagree or they agree if you are committed. Number seven, convenience people look for excuses. They're always looking for a reason why they can't. A reason why they can't, they shouldn't, they didn't, or they won't. Whereas committed people look for solutions. Listen, solutions in marriage can sometimes be complicated. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying any of this is easy. That's the, that's the difference between marriages that break up and marriages that stay together. I'm going to say this. I'm going to stand behind it. Please understand me. I've been there. I've been married 30 years myself. I think I've learned something down through the years. Marriages that break up. Marriages that break up don't break up because they had bigger, worse problems than marriages that stay together. It's just in how they, how they dealt with those problems. How they dealt with those problems. Marriages that break up and quit do not break up and quit because their marriages or their problems were so much more severe than marriages that stay together. Marriages that break up, break up because couples looked for a way out instead of looking for a way to stay together. Listen, you don't have to be married for a month until you find an excuse to get out. Because we're all imperfect. Ask Rochelle, she'll tell you. It doesn't take long. Are you going to look for excuses or are you going to look for solutions? Solutions can be complicated. They can be hard. I get it. Are you one of those people that every day in life looks for, if you're looking for a way out, if you're looking for an exit, listen, if you're looking for an exit, you'll find an exit. It happens every day. 
Number eight, convenience people are outwardly influenced. In other words, they're influenced by the surroundings, they're influenced by the environment, they're influenced by friends, family. Oh boy, sometimes you're not getting good messages. Committed people are inwardly influenced. There's a major difference. They're influenced by the character of who they are on the inside. Number nine, convenience people quit during tough time, tough times, while committed people continue during tough times. I, I want to I wanna share with you, it's, it's a few years old now, but Dr. Dobson shared a study that was done using data from the National Survey of Family Households. And this re- research team studied 5,232 married adults who were interviewed. Of these individuals, 645 of the 5,200 reported being unhappily married. Five years later, those same adults, some of whom had divorced or separated, some of whom had stayed together and stayed married, they were interviewed again. The results of those interviews were astounding. They revealed that a full two-thirds, 66% of the unhappily married spouses who stayed married were actually happier five years later. Among those who initially rated their marriages as very unhappy but remained together, nearly 80% considered themselves happily married or much happier five years later. They stuck it out. Surprisingly, the opposite is found to be true for those who divorced. The Institute for American Values study confirmed that divorce quietly fails, frequently fails to make people happy because while it might provide a respite from the pain associated with a bad marriage, it also introduces a host of complex new emotional and psychological difficulties over which the parties involved had little control. They include child custody battles, emotionally scarred children, economic hardships, loneliness, future romantic disappointments, and on and on. This helps explain why all of the unhappy spouses in the, uh, of all the unhappy spouses in the initial survey, only 19% of those who got divorced or separated were happy five years later. Divorce is not the solution to find happiness. That's what that statistic tells me. Convenience people quit. Commitment people continue. That leads me to number 10. One more thing about convenience people. The the convenience people whine. Commitment people win. They win. Now, I know it's getting really quiet in this room. So let's make a confession. It's really easy to write down these 10 things on a piece of paper. But can I tell you something about those 10 things? and about myself, don't you dare think I got all 10 of those on the commitment column in my life. I I think I could say with a lot of honesty this morning and I could represent a lot of other people in this room that have had solid marriages for decades. You know, I weave in and out of convenience and commitment thinking in my marriage all too frequently. I'm not proud of that. I'm just saying that's true. Sometimes I I, I get really convenience-minded. We have to work through things. we got to straighten it out. And I think that probably represents a lot of people in this room. Some of you might say, Pastor, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've been through. And you're right, I don't. But let me tell you something. Maybe you've had one bad marriage, maybe two bad marriages. Maybe you're in a bad marriage today. I don't know. I I know I'm talking to some people who have made mistakes. They've been divorced maybe once, maybe twice. I am not here this morning to beat you up. The past is the past. Thank God for grace. Amen. But what I want you to hear today is that you can go from where you are right now and live differently than you did before. You can move on from here to where you want to be in the future. You can't go back and undo everything you did. But my friend, listen to this. You can start from where you are today and you can make a brand new end. It can be done. 
There are examples in this room of how it's been done. So I'm not going to focus on where you've been. We, got all, we all got things in our life that we wish we wouldn't have, shouldn't have. We've all got regrets. But I also want this message to be heard clearly. I'm saying if you become a committed person of character, if you begin to live with commitment in mind, you'll have a better marriage. You'll have better relationships. You'll do better in business. You'll be a better follower of Jesus. You will be better in life if you're a person that keeps, keeps your commitments. There are two types of people in this world. There's a person that says, I got to feel it before I do it. But I'm telling you, they're going to lose. You lost yesterday, you'll lose today, and you'll lose tomorrow. Because if you wait for your feelings, you're going to fail at the most important things in life. And then there are those who know that sometimes they have to do it before they feel it. I'm talking to a lot of people in this room. You're waiting to feel it, and you're still waiting. And it's getting worse. They do the right thing even when they don't feel it. They keep their vows. They keep their commitments. Remember, it's a covenant. It's not just you and him or her and you. It's three of you. You made that commitment, that covenant before God. And that means something. That means everything. And character is the ability to carry out your commitments long after the mood has passed. Ecclesiastes 5, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. So I say one more time this morning. Would you think about these things? Before you quit on your marriage, would you at least consider it? Stand with me. Our Father, marriage was not man's idea. It was yours. Genesis 2, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Lord Jesus, my prayer this morning is that there are some people in this room who are struggling. Maybe it's been a long time since they held fast. Maybe they've been leaning too much into the emotions, into the feelings, into the convenience. And that's just not going to cut it. That's not what it's all about. Love is not a feeling. It is a commitment. And I pray some people in this room this morning, maybe right now they join hands and they just begin to pray for a healing over their marriage, a healing over their family, over a relationship. God, that they would that they would seek you, remember their commitment to you. And Lord, I pray one thing that we've not really talked about this morning, but I, I want to include in this prayer, and that is, Father, that in our marriage is the most important thing that we can do is pursue you. Two people focused on Christ cannot fail. I believe that with all my heart. Two people focused on Christ cannot fail. And the reason we can say that, God, is because you are all powerful, you are almighty. There is nothing impossible for you. I have seen marriages, God, you have healed them miraculously when everybody said it was, it was hopeless. So, God, I pray this morning that those who might be thinking about quitting would think about these things, would listen to your Holy Spirit, and would you lead them to a place of healing, forgiveness, and grace? Lord, help them to find help. Seek out counseling, whatever it takes, so that we can keep our vows and our commitments to you. 
And as we're dismissed this morning, can I just say this blessing over you now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. May God bless you.